A well, hello and a very warm welcome to today's webinar on commercial real estate. Have European companies broken free of the funding doom loop brought to you by Scope Ratings? My name is Keith Mullin and it's my pleasure to be your moderator uh, today. And I'm delighted to introduce you to our two speakers today, uh, Philip Vast and Thomas Fay from Scope's corporate ratings team, who in a moment will deliver a short presentation after which we'll go to questions. Uh, Philip, Thomas, great to see you. Thanks for being here today. Uh, now, public bond issuance, as many of you will know, has accelerated over the course of this year, but has access been open to all companies? Has investor confidence recovered? Are banks still, uh, just do banks still have appetite to, to lend to even to weaker companies? Where are we on valuations? So there's a lot of moving parts here, which Philip and Thomas will tackle in a moment. We'll start with a uh, current state of the market in Europe. We'll take a slightly deeper dive into the state of the market in the Nordic regions, and then we'll end with a sector outlook. Now, as I said, we do um, have time for questions, and we'd like to make the session as interactive as possible. So please do type your questions into the questions box on the platform, and we'll, we'll do our best to answer them. Now, today's slides will be available for download at the end of the session, and we've also made available a research note that Philip authored a few weeks ago on the topic of capital markets access. I'll explain how to download the files at the end of the session. So that's it from me. Philip, I believe you're going to kick us off. So let me hand over to you. Yeah, thank you, Keith. And also a warm welcome from my side. And as Keith just introduced today, we'll talk about our view on whether the European property sector has broken out of the funding doom loop. And as you can see, and the bottom uh, chart, actually the rate cuts by the Swedish Riksbank Bank in May, followed by rate cuts by the ECB since June, and also the Bank of England in August 2024. So here it's just here. Uh, the Eurozone, of course, with regards to risk-free yields, has led to some relief in both risk-free yields and underlying refinancing costs. All of it, which uh, was expected actually due to low inflation and a more subdued macroeconomic outlook. So, as you can see, risk-free yields stood at around 2.5% last Friday, which is below their peak of roughly 3% in October 2023, but up from the 2.2% we have seen at the end of September. Still, the spread between prime and risk-free yields appears to have stabilized at around 250 to 275 bips for commercial real estate and 225 to 250 bips for multifamily real estate. And what is much more important, and you can see this also by, let's say, the slope of uh, the lines you see in the bottom slide, the pace of yield expansion has slowed significantly in the six months to end June. Just to give you some comparables, if we talk about the yield widening for prime office, uh, actually year on year, so up until the end of June this year, there was a yield widening of around 60 bips, whereas just 15 bips, so to say, have been contributed during the first half of this year. In comparison, for example, for retail, prime yields widened by around 26 bips uh, year on year. And there was even a yield um, contraction in the first half of this year. So actually, we see a much more stable environment if it comes to yields. And as a result, we have also observed limited fair value adjustments. And you can see this in the top chart on that slide. So within our peer group of 53 European property companies in H1 2024, you can see that fair value adjustments have been rather minor. There have been some negative outliers and these represent either companies that have been in financial distress or UK based property companies. Why this is so, I will come to that later on. The question is whether negative value adjustments of companies in financial distress reflect the true bottom of market values. So there we have seen declines of 6 up to 10%, even in the first half of this year, uh, which peers have not yet reached and are trying to avoid by riding out the cycle in the hope of a broader recovery on the back of improved financial conditions and a lower interest rate environment. And if we move on to the next slide, <clears throat> These hopes yeah, may be borne out as the market appears much more willing to invest into real estate. So the main drivers here are, of course, lower underlying um, financing costs, so lower swap rates. See the upper chart, so there the red line actually shows the development of uh, the three years against the five-year 
uh, three months against five year euro swap rate. And of course, also lower margin expectations. So the lower chart in the table on the bottom right show you um, how margins actually developed. So generally we see that that investors appetite grows with increasing confidence that the interest rate cycle has peaked and rates will either stabilize at current levels or will fall further. As a result, all in financing costs for investment grade rated issuers and the debt capital markets has fallen from over 5% a year ago to below 4% at the end of September for a five-year bond. So however, non-investment grade rated companies still face significant higher all-in funding costs than before the monetary tightening that started in 2022. So margins remain at least twice as high as before. You can see this in the uh, bottom right table. Yeah, and this effectively uh, somewhat prices out these companies from the debt capital markets because borrowing costs started around six and a half percent for these type of companies and there is no limit so even some companies need to refinance at more than 10 percent which is three to four times higher than the level we experienced at the end of 2021 and it's actually really unsustainable with high leverage uh, and uh, real estate assets that might yield less than the borrowing costs so there might be some further room for negative value adjustments just driven by that on the weaker end. However, these issues are more tempted to shift to secured financing if possible. Um, of course, the spreads um, of margins are very different in between different asset classes. So even also the swap to secured financing might not be possible for all assets, especially if we talk about secondary uh, office properties. So uh, the spreads range in between 140 bips for multifamily assets up to above 200 bips for office properties. So these companies might also switch uh, to some form of mezzanine financing or selling assets at a discount to deleverage. Therefore, we see higher for value adjustments uh, on the distressed end or raising fresh equity and all to buy back bonds below par or in the end to do a combination of all. These restructuring efforts for the time being, actually for some of the issues we follow, bear fruit. So the confidence slowly returns to the sector and interest rates have fallen. And we can also see that in the Z spreads that have narrowed sharply over the last two to three months. You can see this on the top uh, bottom left chart where we compare the Z spreads across different rating categories uh, and by the bars you can see there. So dark blue is uh, as of August and light blue is uh, as of October. So, and if you do the math, yeah, the positive spread between the prime yields, uh, which are at between 4.9 to 5.4%, depending on the asset class, and all in financing costs of around 4%, at least for these uh, highly rated companies, make investment in real estate assets marginal creative and support transaction activity, and will continue to do so. You can see this on the uh, left hand chart where we show the a slight recovery in the trading 12 months investment volume since the first quarter in 2024. So it's still sluggish, but there there is a positive tendency. And as I said, um, it also explains the more negative outliers and fair value adjustments uh, for some UK property companies. So the spread in between the prime yields as well as the all in uh, financing costs in UK is not as wide as it is for companies that are domiciled in the European Union. So there might be some further room for negative fair value adjustments. But more importantly, actually, debt capital markets appear to be more accessible. Yeah, with bond marketing conditions improving for more issuers. While in August, we state that uh, actually also triple B minus companies are somewhat squeezed out of the market or need to pay very, very high margins and um, to issue debt on these markets. We can see that um, there is an improvement since. So margins came in, in and there is a more pronounced activity also of these weaker investment grade uh, companies uh, with uh, support uh, from this, let's say, more confidence uh, we have, not we have, but also that investors have into the sector. So the recent issuance activity by Castellum or TAG Immobilien and much more recently Heimstar and Boosted underpins just the regained access of this group of issuers. Yeah, and with that, I will give on, uh, pass on to Thomas who will share his view 
on these items with a focus on the Nordics. Thank you very much, Philip, and also a warm welcome from my side. The Nordic bond and also the bank market has been and is still a market of floating rate debt. Hence, changes in the central bank's headline rates find their way quickly into credit metrics. So no surprise, uh, with real estate being highly sensitive to changes in rates, uh, these credit metrics have deteriorated significantly during the uh, crisis. A year ago, in a similar format, the main focus was on interest coverage. You can see that on the left-hand side. Uh, the deterioration is clearly visible in interest coverage, and it was only somewhat slowed down by hedging ratios that were just under 70%. This sounds quite okay, but compared to European peers with around 90% of fixed rates, it was rather low. And also asset disposals with subsequent deleveraging helped slowing down the decline. What we now have observed during 2024 is a clear stabilization in this deterioration uh, on, in this crucial metrics. It stabilized around 2.6 times for our peer group of 25 listed peers in the Nordics. What has helped actually stabilizing this metric? Three things. Firstly, the early rate cuts in the Swedish market followed by the ECB rate cuts reduced the burden from the floating exposure and made a renewal of macro hedges uh, possible. Secondly, a switch to secured bank funding with respective lower yields and uh, lower spreads uh, have helped to stabilize interest burden. And then lastly, the reopening of bond markets that we have observed in 2024 in the Nordics and the related tightening of spreads thanks to uh, confidence of debt investors have helped bottoming out interest cover. On LTV, real estate valuations really came under pressure from higher rates which made the ratio creep upwards and this despite the leveraging efforts across the board finally in 2024 uh, we've seen these efforts bearing fruit and the trend in loan to value is going now in the right direction again on debt to EBITDA, we can see that actually the deleveraging has started early, uh, which certainly also was helped by high inflation and related CPI rent indexation that increased the denominator of this crucial metrics. Now, Nordic bond markets opened earlier. As mentioned, Real estate companies were heavy users of bond markets to finance growth. And given a relatively short average bond tenure of three to five years here in the Nordics, a well-functioning market for refinancing is crucial. When the sentiment turned sour in Nordic real estate, so did bond markets. Issuance volumes from mid 2022 until end 2023 were at record low levels, as you can see from the graph here. And only high quality issuers enjoyed access. To underline that, 65% uh, of transactions in 2023 went to single A rated companies or above. So basically only the best companies had access to bond markets. The announcement by the Swedish Riksbank that the interest rate hike cycle had come to an end in December 2023 can be seen as a starting point of a reopening market. The long-awaited first rate cut came, as we know, in May 2024, and bond markets have returned to strength also after summer break, relieving the banks from further shouldering maturing real estate debt. On banks, the six largest Nordic banks have all increased their exposure to the commercial real estate sector over the last three years. On average, they lend 17% of their loan book to the sector, compared to just 6% for the European average. 
What helped further is the five-year swap rates that came down significantly since April 2024, as also mentioned by Philip. They're providing confidence to the rally. In addition, equity markets have reopened for Nordic real estate companies, as demonstrated by the IPOs of public property invest here in Norway, or Prisma Properties and Svea Festiette in Sweden. In addition, we've seen several rights issues this year as well. Spreads for investment grade quality issuers have tightened significantly as a function of investor confidence and functioning markets and have returned to more normal levels. With that, over to you again, Philip. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. So what is left now? Yeah, Financing has become more accessible. Some heavyweight restructuring has been successful, for example, for Adler Group and the transaction volumes finally are picking up. So all good, it seems, yeah. But however, refinancing remains the key challenge. And you can see this here in the charts. So there are more than 120 billion of debt uh, in the capital markets that needs to be refinanced in between 2025 and 2027. Uh, 2027. So this represents an increase of more than 40% compared to the three years between 2022 and 2024. And with borrowing costs actually two to three times higher than in 2021, so this is exactly what we expect, some issues will be priced off the, uh, out of the capital markets and shift to secured financing. On the one hand, of course, banks have become more cautious and selective, but continue to lend to the sector with risk appetite that reflects the property type, the ultimate ownership, the leverage, and most importantly, the location. So they are willing to roll over existing financing for operationally sound properties and portfolios. At least this is what we see. Of course, there have been some exceptions where banks just reject to extend financing, but then there have been, let's say, some operational or let's say structural issues attached to these specific portfolios. Um, but generally banks are willing to extend the financing. On the other hand, banks are also providing new lending where security packages are strong and covenants are tight. While recent research by CREFC and AEW suggests that there is some easing of covenants and margins to support generally the deal activity in the sector. Still, yeah, secured bank lending can only cover a marginal portion of the refinancing of maturing bonds, leaving non-investment grade rated issues under pressure to restructure their assets or liabilities or both to protect their credit worthiness most likely at a high cost to both equity and debt holders. So what we expect from that is, of course, that there will be some companies still that will struggle with um, the refinancing uh, of their unsecured debt they have outstanding in the debt capital markets, which could lead to ongoing deterioration in credit quality for the weaker end of the property companies. But, <clears throat> I have, sorry. Thomas, maybe and you share your view on how this will be addressed in the Nordics. Thank you, Philip. Yes, I mean, we have similar issues here uh, that can be observed where significant uh, refinancing lies ahead, as you can see on this graph here. Uh, given the previous graph, I mean, record high bond volumes have been printed in 2021 up until Q1 uh, 2022. And now fast forward three years and uh, we're in the refinancing of this one. So the Q, the first quarter 2025 refinancing peak we can see here is uh, that uh, quarter, first quarter 2022 maturing. Worries of such refinancing have been partially already addressed with recent bond issuances. And uh, we have reasons to believe that with the reopened uh, SEC and NOC markets for the upcoming maturities uh, in these markets, this should be manageable. Also, in addition to secured bank financing that is still available. Nordic real estate companies have historically also issued bonds in the euro market. And this one uh, appears to be less open so far for refinancing. 45% of outstanding real estate bonds in the Nordics have been issued in Euro. Uh, this translates into roughly 270 billion Swedish crowns that need to be refinanced. Uh, in the next two years alone, around 6 billion euros are up for refinancing. And so far in 2024, only the largest players have managed to refinance in Euro. 
Philip mentioned a few examples, Heimstad and Bustad, Castellum, Svea Fastia, the Sargax, Citicon and Koyamo touched uh, the market there. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. And there are also other risks that still remain in the sector. So first of all, of course, what we're all interested in, there is a risk of further fair value corrections. So actually the adjustment of values had not yet finalized. So further distressed asset sales and the potential wave of asset sales by open-ended real estate funds to cope with the capital outflows could lead to a second wave of price corrections, but maybe not as severe as what we have seen so far. So on the right-hand chart, you can see in the blue shaded part of the uh, bars and um, the current fair value corrections that we experienced so far, at least in the REIT sector of the 53 property companies we cover. And then uh, the red part of the bars represents um, the fair value corrections we still expect for the different asset classes. Yeah, but as I said, even if there is a second wave, they might not be as severe as uh, the first wave we have seen so far, especially as the amount of distressed sales will be rather limited in comparison to the overall transaction volume. But more importantly, actually, despite the slowdown and fair value corrections in our peer group, the sector remains under extended pressure, largely driven by a greater differentiation between prime and non-prime assets. So especially secondary assets will still face severe, let's say, fair value adjustments, uh, which also reflects the high investment needs, which we estimated between 225 to 600 billion euros per annum, just, lonely, uh, just only to actually address the needs to become carbon neutral by 2050. So this reflects actually the investment volume for the whole European property stock and is not the investment volume for the PSB cover. And without compromising their social role in providing affordable housing commercial space, this may only be achievable through a massive revaluation of property assets and the loss of economic wealth for owners over the next decade. So really to make these investments feasible, actually prices need to correct even further beyond the price correction we have seen so far, especially for secondary assets. That might not unfold in the next three to six months, but as I said, over the next 10 years, there is still, let's say, some heightened risk that we will see these more pronounced fair value corrections. The second risk actually that is uh, to be seen is the risk of covenant breaches. So higher funding costs will need to be carefully managed by issuers to avoid breaching ICR covenants. Um, and if there are further fair value declines, especially for non-prime assets, these could easily evaporate the headroom under LTV covenants for some issuers. And issuers also will need to find a sweet spot for their funding mix yeah, to avoid breaching the unencumbered asset ratio, which is also part of most of the bond documentations and financial covenants um, issuers need to adhere to. So this will either require a covenant waiver if the, let's say, weaker companies uh, shift their financing exposure more to the secured financing yeah or a complete exit from the capital markets in the short term but lenders at least as what we see seem to be much more constructive these days as they have been a year ago so over to you thomas thank you philip uh, yes, Nordics ahead of the curve. We are carefully optimistic for Nordic real estate when we look at fundamentals. So growth paths for the different Nordic countries are mixed, but overall real income growth and monetary easing are supportive. The Nordic property markets are also in many ways more dynamic than the European one, uh, which makes for stronger shocks but also for an earlier and sharper recovery. And uh, transactions have restarted on a broader level. And in uh, Q3 2024, that was actually the first quarter since end 2022, when acquisitions exceeded disposals. You can see that in the upper uh, graph here, the blue one are the acquisitions and uh, the red ones are uh, the disposals that dominated uh, most of the last two years. Nevertheless, also in the Nordics, risk remain. 
in addition to the ones that Philip mentioned, uh, we also see here that the vacancy outlook remains mixed with diverging trends across segments. There's offices and retail to watch, we believe. And then the flip side of lower inflations that we just praised and the, obviously uh, the, in, the lower rates that we see through that are CPA indexed rents. So with high inflation, those benefit the top line and EBITDA alike in the past two years, but rental growth will not provide the same uplift to metrics in the future. On the financial side, we see a general relaxation. As discussed, Nordic bond markets have reopened, exemplified by an issuance volume in the first half of 2024 that matched the issuance for the whole of 2023. Valuations have repriced maybe faster than in continental Europe, added to the pain initially, but we have observed in our po uh, peer group the first positive fair value development in the third quarter 2024, as can be seen on the lower graph here. Maybe the start of a trend, at least we do not foresee big corrections going forward. And on interest coverage, ratios have mostly bottomed out and stabilized over the last quarters, supported by macro hedges that were renewed and the decline in rates. While risk remain, we argue that the Nordics may be ahead of the curve and uh, will enjoy a bit less pressure on the credit quality of real estate issuers going forward. And with that, I'll hand over to Philip for the closing remarks. Yeah, so what we finally see is actually that uh, the worst of the recent financing crunch is over, but the credit outlook from let's say the weaker end of the companies remains highly uncertain. So we will see a greater differentiation in between those companies that are investment grade and those that are non-investment grade. While this has sort of say, especially margins actually for these two group of companies have narrowed during uh, the uh, period of monetary loosening um, the monetary tightening actually and also the risk perception of investors led to an increase in margins and therefore also to more struggles or higher struggles for the non-investment grade part of the universe. So we will see a much more volatile development of the credit profile of these companies going forward. Very good. I think um, that uh, is the end of the uh, prepared comments. So thank you very much, uh, Philip and Thomas, for your comments. Um, so I've collected some questions here. So to our viewers on the session here, please do type your questions in um, in the remaining uh, time that we have. Uh, but please note that um, we won't be able to discuss individual companies uh, and would prefer to, to steer clear at this point of discussing individual countries. Um, so we'll keep it fairly high level. We can discuss sub-regions if that's of interest. Um, otherwise, we'll keep it at the sector level. Um, but so let's go straight to questions. So in fact, uh, Thomas, there's a question here uh, following on from a comment that you made. Um, and it's a very simple question. Why are Nordic property markets more dynamic than European, to your point? Yes, sure. Thanks, Keith. Very good question. Uh, I believe, I mean, there's several factors that play in here. Uh, one of them is that, for example, rental terms are shorter. Uh, so there's a more renewal going on. Uh, so if the market is weakening, this will translate more quickly into valuations, into the balance sheets of companies. Uh, so the economy factor plays in fairly quickly. Then we have that floating rate exposure and generally we have a shorter tenor of financing in the Nordics as well. Again, and these markets create more dynamics uh, in both uh, directions. So, I mean, they help on the upside, but they're also very painful on the downside. Uh, so I think these are factors that all play into a more dynamic market that have been demonstrated over the last two years 
uh, with painful corrections that came relatively quickly. Uh, but also maybe that have bottomed out. While we see in the wider European market that some of the uh, of these dynamics are still ongoing, came maybe at a later stage and uh, drag on for longer than they do in the Nordics. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and Philip, I guess you know the general thread of of the comments was that we're over. In fact, you said that we're over the worst, but not everyone's got. Uh, reasonable uh, bond market access. The banks are kind of more or less playing ball, uh, but not for everyone. So I was just wondering, um, given that we're over the worst, um, I guess the focus shifts to companies that maybe don't have access to the capital markets. And can you sort of make any general deductions uh, based on the financing we've seen uh, about which companies have access and which don't? Is Are there sort of factors that is it, is it simply investing grade, non investing grade, or are there other factors at play? Okay, um, if you would have asked the questions three months ago, actually, um, the answer would be a bit more different than what I answered today. So, three months ago, actually, as I highlighted, even triple B minus companies had their issues to actually access debt capital markets for two reasons. The first one was that investors might fear that these companies, so to say, migrate to a non-investment grade territory. But on the other hand, also, if you have, let's say, bad reputation in the market, yeah, meaning that um, there might be some perceived governance issues or whatsoever, uh, even if you are, let's say, rated in the investment grade territory, and the access actually uh, to capital markets was very, very limited. Um, as also investors fear that these bad reputation will materialize and uh, will actually consequentially lead to, let's say, weaker credit quality over the medium term. This has changed right now. So actually the perception of investors is, as I said, much more um, bullish, not overly bullish, but it's more bullish than it has been. Um, as I said, we reached uh, the peak of the interest rate cycle. And so everything is much more planable to that extent also from the investors end and if you want me to distinguish between those companies that have easy access and those that have not that easy access so actually all companies have access yeah uh, that's not the question the problem is so to say what is the price of having that access so the underlying base rate is the very same for everybody but the risk premium that is expressed by the margin um, is substantially different yeah, from investment grade to non-investment grade rated companies. And as I highlighted, if you start refinancing at six and a half percent, yeah, and this is really the lower uh, uh, or it's the bottom actually of the refinancing rate for non-investment grade um, companies, then it might be a challenge yeah, if you are non-investment grade for, for a reason because you have a low leverage or a low interest cover or whatsoever. And uh, then it might be a challenge if your portfolio maybe just yields 5.4% or 5.5%. So there is inherently, so to say, a negative spread in between what your portfolio yields and what you have to pay. Yeah. And on the other hand, of course, if you enter into these markets and maybe you can afford it, yeah, as I said, if you refinance at six and a half, seven or eight percent, it will clearly have an impact on your interest coverage. So you will be also very hesitant to do that, even if you say, oh, I can also live with a 1.3 ICR instead of a 2.3, yeah, but in the end, it could lead to a covenant breach, which would accelerate actually a repayment of the bonds that are outstanding. So it's, yeah, there is a, a distinction really in between um, the non-investment and investment grade world right now, but still, um, there is some clear, let's say, benefit for the more stable sectors. Um, or segments like residential real estate or so multifamily, as well as logistics and industrials in comparison to retail and office uh, property holders. And uh, if a company is so to say heavily invested into office or retail properties, actually access is just justified if they have the top of the crop of assets there and if the leverage is very low. Yeah, there are a few examples that are rated at triple B plus or even above for these kind of companies that really have a, the right portfolio uh, exposure and uh, also learned the lesson 
during the last global financial crisis to reduce leverage. And this is actually the, the main differentiating factor right now that why we haven't seen, let's say, such a crunch like we have seen um, more than 10 years ago because companies entered into that, let's say, more illiquid situation with lower leverage and higher interest cover. And you have the benefit of, in comparison to developers or whatsoever, of uh, lease contracts yeah, that extend uh, over a period of three, five, or even 10 years, which ensure at least the cash flow visibility and ensure also the ability to handle with these or deal with these um, obstacles we've seen right now. Yeah. yeah. Thomas, feel free to, to, to add to that, but let me ask perhaps a follow on question, and you kind of refer to it in your prepared comments. Um, you, you know, can you just recap what's your read of the, of the bank's preparedness? to continue funding commercial real estate um, with competitive secure financing. I, I was just taken with, with what Philip was saying about the, that, that pricing differentiation um, as you go uh, you know, along down the rating scale. Um, I'm, just, I'm imagining that sometime in, the, in, in, the, in, the, in those cases where the spreads are very high, there's a temptation that there's, or there's a driver to push it into secure bank financing. But you know, are the banks playing? Yeah, no, good question. I mean, like what we've seen throughout this crisis uh, is actually that the banks were ready to lend on a secured basis and uh, this market seemed to be uh, open for most companies and seemed to be well functioning. We received a lot of questions about that also about a year ago in the midst of the crisis and we went back to our rating customers, we went back to the banks and inquired about that, discussed it with our internal banks team as well, and everyone uh, confirmed that the Nordic banks were ready to uh, provide secured funding. And if you think about it, it's not so surprising because what we've seen maybe in other markets, let's take the US as an example, suddenly there's a shift in the structure, home office was a big topic and uh, offices suddenly were empty and you were left with a stranded asset. Now in the Nordics you don't have these dynamics, home office was always there and there's always been a mix, so these kind of structural shifts we haven't seen up here in the Nordics. And then all real estate issuers have historically had bank financing as well, in addition to bond financing. So it was always playing one against the other. Uh, and thereby the bank, bank market was always there uh, to support also in the good times. So I think in general, the banks were there, the banks are still there to lend on a secured basis and they are willing maybe also on the lower rated uh, companies to provide that because if you have a security pledged with a cash flow that covers the interest uh, and in addition maybe some amortization and uh, as philip pointed out the good headroom to covenants then it's a limited risk to do that on a first lien pledge yeah okay thanks i just wanted to um ask about, uh, about valuations because um, I mean there was some mention of this but uh, because you know there's a lot of conversation a lot of chatter over the last couple of years about where valuations were um, so I, I guess the question is has, been, has there been enough sales activity for a clear consensus to emerge, to emerge around where valuations are um, and can you factor in perhaps the cycle of negative fair value adjustments maybe distressed sales um, any kind of top line thoughts you can you can you can you can offer there? Philip. Yeah, so generally, <clears throat> as you can see, maybe I'll just switch back to the transaction volume. There was, yeah, a steep, let's say, decline in transaction volume. So there is not that much of an evidence, but there is still some transaction volume also for certain asset classes that are uh, favored by investors. Um, but generally, yeah, the, the evidence is maybe not as broad as it has been uh, prior to uh, the recent, let's say, decline on that front. Um, what we see is, of course, that um, issuers that still have market access, also the debt capital market, so where there is no, let's say, heightened pressure to sell assets because there are also other opportunities to shore up um, liquidity and to repay debt or refinance existing debt, 
they mostly sell at book value. So actually there is not, let's say, such a huge gap in between what they report, the portfolio is worth, uh, and that what they really realize when selling the assets. This is totally different to the distressed end of the of the spectrum, where we see not only on average um, further fair value decline of between four to six percent in the first half of this year, but also if we look at specific cases, uh, so specific properties, they have been sold 20% below book value. Yeah, which means, of course, that potential investors uh, are really much aware of the, let's say, difficult situation um, the company is in, and therefore, yeah, just are on uh, have some leverage to 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 play that card to negotiate a, a lower price. Yeah, but these issues are for a specific reason also there where they are, and mostly these reasons are. Um, generally higher leverage and a generally weaker property portfolio. So if they focus on secondary assets and uh, fuel the growth in uh, the more recent past with, so say, um, low interest uh, rate um, carrying debt yeah, to be able to grow, so they have a high leverage and have a, let's say, weak portfolio, yeah, then you're screwed. Yeah, okay. And Thomas, does that, does, that, does that hold for the Nordics too? That the, the, the same themes carry through. Yeah, I would I would say so as well. I mean, like what we see in the the headline transactions, they are at book value or very small uh, discounts to it. Some even reported that they sold at a slight premium, proudly tapping their backs, uh, but the distressed sales that we've seen are maybe from like syndicates that we've observed uh, where like uh, yeah, in the good times the syndicate came together and uh, put together highly leveraged property but these are basically one trick ponies that are now coming to a refinancing and uh, no one is willing to put in further equity and then they come up uh, for a distressed sale and those have been picked up by uh, some of our peers here in the Nordics uh, at a, a good discount and that obviously then helps uh, you as a buy and hold company again in your portfolio if you get hold of such uh, a distressed case but we haven't seen that many uh, in our coverage there. Right. Okay, look, we're just coming to the end of, of our session. I've just got one question. It's a big question, and, and it, it, it's, probably, it, it's probably worthy of its, of its own webinar. But um, I think we mentioned it um, in passing. But um, uh, the commercial property sector, like other sectors, is facing decarbonisation challenges and sustainability issues. In fact, like like, every, like all companies are. But um, this is obviously clearly a, a, a big differentiator in, in, in the commercial property world. Uh, that's the way it's been it, 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 it's been um, put out there. But can you talk briefly, either of you or both of you, in fact, about the yeah, I guess decarbonisation challenges the sector faces? Yeah, so generally the challenge is pretty high. As uh, actually, European property stock accounts for more than thirty percent of the carbon emissions. Yeah, just during, so to say, its operation, not only um, uh, covering the construction of these properties. So there is a lot of things that need to be addressed to be really uh, carbon neutral by 2050. And um, lenders are more and more, let's say, looking into, let's say, the EPC grades of the specific properties um, to be able to uh, val evaluate the risk that is attached to uh, future investments that are needed to decarbonize. Uh, a specific property or a portfolio um, and the, the larger ones actually so the, the ones with the financial mus muscle deal with that uh, and twofold so first of all is of course dispose of the weaker properties yeah um, to just in, improve the portfolio quality on the other hand but also they have um, the financial muscle to deal with the investments um that are ahead of them and most of them actually target um to be carbon neutral before 2050 but yeah this is just so to say the, the the positive peak of the iceberg everything what we do not see is mostly held by either uh, one property companies or very small companies or private individuals and uh, what we expect there as i highlighted over the next decade there will be yeah a massive 
a value adjustment for those properties that need heavy investment and where there is limited demand. So if you talk about just an example, a secondary office, yeah, maybe rents um, that are achievable within these kind of properties are not uh, allowing a real positive return on the investments that are needed. So either you're faced with having a stranded asset yeah, or you sell at a huge discount to today's book value, even if this is not included nowadays, um, to yeah capture the, the future investments that are needed to make this asset uh, marketable again. Yeah. Okay, anything to add, Thomas? Yeah, no, I mean, it uh, sums up uh, the thoughts here uh, in the Nordics as well. I mean, maybe... ESG and the whole decarbonization has been uh, a topic here for a long time already. And I think the big players are certainly better prepared than maybe the smaller ones, uh, also driven by, by uh, demand from tenants that required such uh, decarbonization and the plan to get there. So I think, uh, I mean, we will see a uh, divergence in assets here also. Okay. Good. We'll look, at, on that note, and given our time, uh, uh, we've had a very patient audience of uh, stayed till the end. So I think we should. I've, I've uh, kind of come to the end of the questions I had. So uh, let's close the session there. Uh, so thank you very much, Philip uh, and Thomas, for your comments and for answering the questions. Thank you very much to our viewers. Um, hope you found that uh, useful. I did say at the beginning that I would show you how to download uh, two documents we made available today. Um, and let me do that now. If you go at the bottom of the screen to there's an apps button. If you click on apps, you'll see handouts pop up. You click on handouts. Hopefully, yes, there are two files there available to download. Um, the first one um, is the research note I mentioned that uh, um, that Philip uh, authored some weeks ago, um, and the second one is the um, the slides for today's presentation. So um, I'll give you a few seconds to get those downloaded. Um, in the meantime, um, we at Scope, we do uh, conduct these outreach exercises on a fairly regular basis. CRE has been an incredibly topical theme, uh, and we've got a lot of reverse inquiry on, on this. And so uh, given where we are, uh, and we've postulated uh, a cautious, optimistic outlook, uh, well, let's see how things evolve. And at the appropriate time, we'll come back and give you an update. Um, so between, uh, or rather in the meantime, I wish you a very successful and hopefully fun rest of the day. And we'll see you next time. So it's goodbye from us.